Welcome back to the Dante's Inferno notes. Previously on the Inferno. This place totally gives me the creeps. <laughs> Dante? Dante? Just hanging in the garden. Hey, hey Homer, what's up? Hey, Ave, hey. Lucan. Yeah, I'm a poet. I'm a poet, I'm a poet. Uh uh. Bum 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 bum. It's Inferno, Inferno. But a dum bum bum bum. We're looking at Cantos 5 through 7 today. Canto 5 begins Thus I went down from where the first circle lies into the second, which surrounds less space, but much more pain, provoking wails and cries. Dante describes here again the shape of the Inferno. We mentioned it last time. It's a giant funnel that descends down, and he comments on how each ring is smaller as you go closer and closer to the center of the Inferno. Not only do the rings get smaller, but the pain intensifies as you go lower and lower. Now, as we descend down into the Inferno, we're going to see a lot of different kinds of punishments, and all of them are pretty bizarre and pretty strange. And Dante's going to tell us that the lower we go, the more intense the punishment gets. But we may question that. After all, is it worse to get boiled alive, frozen to death, or have your limbs hacked off repeatedly? Well, that's kind of a subjective question, and so Dante just foregoes the whole question, not attempting to exhibit punishments that show the most physical pain, but simply saying, this is greater pain as you go lower. This simplifies the problem, and instead pushes the focus not from what we think would hurt us the most, to what symbolically represents the crime. The idea of contrapasso again. So each punishment, as you go farther and farther down, is going to really reflect the crime that's been committed. It's going to be a repetition, symbolically, of the crime that's been committed. And the punishments are going to get more and more intense just because Dante says so. Again, why are they getting more intense? What causes you to fall deeper and deeper into hell? It's all about the will. The more you will your crime, the more you will your sin, the deeper into the inferno you descend. As we continue, we also run into Minos, who's another mythological figure. We talked about the allegory of mythology and how that poetic allegory, Dante uses these characters from mythology that he doesn't actually believe in, in order to symbolize a truth. Now, in mythology, Minos is a pretty rotten guy. But he was also associated with judgment and with casting people into judgment. He serves the same sort of role here. The giant Minos stands there with a huge tail. And as the sinners stand before him, he wraps his tail around his body the number of rings they need to go down. So if you come across a really bad sinner, he'll wrap him around eight times and drop him all the way down to level eight. It's important to recognize here that these guardians in the Inferno are also still condemned to be in hell. They were rotten in their lifetime, and now part of their punishment is to continue to serve in this area of hell. No one is in the Inferno because they want to be there, not even the guardians. Once again, Minos threatens Dante, but Virgil waves him out of the way, reminding him of their divine right to make this journey. Minos says, O oh, you who come to this house of pain, beware how you enter and where you place your confidence. Do not let yourself be fooled by the wide door. And my leader, why do you too take offense? Do not obstruct the path he is fated for. Thus it is willed where there is power to do what has been willed, so question it no more. You might notice here that when Virgil talks about God, he can't actually say the name God. This is because they're down in the inferno where they don't use the name of God. Hell is so far removed from God that even his name doesn't descend down here. Even though his power still encompasses this hell, and even though we're still going to see the power of Christ and Christ's victory as we walk through hell. So, immediately after meeting Minos, he comes to the second circle. We remember the first circle was the virtuous pagans. They got away with simply a lack of hope. They were good people, but they can never achieve heaven because they weren't part of Christianity. Now we descend into the true sinners, starting in Circle 2. Circle 2 is a giant whirlwind that swirls around and around and around with all these souls blowing back and forth in it, without ever having a chance to rest. These are the lustful, the ones who were blown about by their passions in life, who couldn't control their own lusts, and so were never grounded with reason. Dante describes them. The hellish wind blows free, sweeping the spirits headlong through the air. It whirls and pounds and mauls them endlessly. It carries them back before the ruin, where they shriek and moan and utter their laments and curse the almighty power that sent them there. The souls condemned to bear these punishments, I learned, are the carnal sinners of lust so strong they let it master reason and good sense. So, as they're being tossed around in the whirlwind, 
it symbolizes the way they were tossed around by their passions and did not have that reason and good sense that he talks about. They weren't grounded. But also notice how they curse heaven and they curse God as they're being blown around. They still feel like it was someone else's problem that got them here. It wasn't their own lust. It wasn't their own lack of self-control. It was God's fault. Not only do the spinning lustful souls represent the way that lust blew them off their feet, but also this spinning motion parodies the image of love in heaven. The angels fly in circles around God, illustrating the concept of divine love, where the lustful are hurled in circles, a parody, because lust is really a twisted version of love. Virgil points out several sinners as they pass through this section. Most of these sinners have political significances, like Helen of Troy, or Paris, Guido, Cleopatra, Tristan. Part of the significance of all these figures is that their lusts and their lack of self-control led to problems in their countries, problems in their state, political problems. Think about Paris and Helen of Troy, the way their lust for each other caused a terrible war and the destruction of Paris's own hometown and the death of his whole family. Dante won't let this topic drop for very long. He's thinking of Florence and the way that politics get mixed in with bad behavior and how that leads to the destruction of his town. As he's traveling through the Inferno, he's not only learning about what it means to be human, all the ways humans can fail, but all the ways humans can destroy their own political system. And he's trying to answer the question, why did this happen to Florence? Dante notices a pair of sinners who seem to be blowing together, and he wants to speak to them. So he asks Virgil if they may speak to these two. This is one of the most significant moments in the Inferno, their encounter with Francesca and Paolo. Now, Paolo is not going to speak, and this sort of sets up a pattern throughout the Inferno. Very frequently, we're going to run into pairs of sinners who are paired for a specific reason. One will speak and one will not. Francesca was a contemporary of Dante's. She lived around the same time as Dante, but a few towns away. Francesca died about 12 years before the events of the Inferno, so she would have been familiar with Dante's poetry because Dante was an established poet all throughout Italy by that point. Her story, in short, is that she married but then fell in love with her brother-in-law and had an affair with him. Her husband found out about it and murdered them both. They're able to pause and talk to Dante for a moment, and she begins by speaking of the place where she was born in line 97. The place where I was born is the city set along the shore where the Po descends to be at peace at last with those that follow it. Notice how she's talking about her home. She uses words set and at peace, both these ideas of being still and calm, opposites of what she's experiencing right now. She's being tossed around and constantly moving and unable to ever pause or rest. And so her desire is for that rest, that peace, that stillness. Dante's going to use this technique of using key words throughout his descriptions that emphasize these ideas. You want to show your picture? What is it? It's... Do you see a monkey? Mm-hmm. Is it the Chinese New Year? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's what looks like it's your stomach. Thank you! Dante is going to use this technique of slipping in words into his poetry that emphasize whatever idea he's exploring. You can see how significant language is to him. As I mentioned before, the idea of the encyclopedia, he's trying to encompass every different style of voice. And he's going to try to accomplish that as he goes through the Inferno. But Francesca continues, Love, which in gentle hearts flares rapidly, sees this one from my lovely body. How it was violently stripped away still injures me. Love, which, when one is loved, does not allow that it be refused, sees me with joy in him, which, as you see, is even with me now. Love led us to a single death. The grim Caena waits to claim our murderer. Notice the way she talks about love here. She's speaking of love that is this wonderful, inspiring feeling, emotion, and talks about how love destroyed her. Look at the verbs she uses. It flares, it seized, it violently stripped, led us to death. The way she talks about love is very violent and very vicious, as if here she is walking along, minding her own business, and all of a sudden love grabs her by the chest and... As if she had no choice in the matter whatsoever. But something else is happening here as well. Not only is she blaming love, but she's also using language that 
sounds pretty familiar to people who know Dante. This talk of love, this repetition, love which in gentle hearts, love which when one is loved, love led us to a single death. Each of these three stanzas begins with the same word, love, love, love. It's this very romantic tradition of poetry, lyrical love poems that Dante was so famous for writing. Dante and his friends who wrote these poems about love in the sweet new style. In fact, her line, as she begins, sounds almost exactly like Dante's own poetry. Now, it's quite possible that Francesca knew Dante's poetry, given the time period that she lived in. So, would it be possible that she's half-quoting his poetry as she speaks here? Absolutely. And the effect on Dante is important. Not only that, but the things that she's saying about love completely counteract his other ideas of love. Back to Canto 2. When Beatrice is telling Virgil why she's coming to rescue Dante, she says in line 72, Love prompted me. Love makes me ask you this. She also acts as though love is the one directing her and causing her to do something, as if it's driving her to a certain end. But it's quite a different result. She's talking about divine love that causes her to seek out and save Dante from disaster. Francesca is talking about selfish lust that overwhelms her soul and drives her to sleep with her brother-in-law. They're very different things, but they're speaking of them in similar terms. Dante begins to question the way poetry deals with love, the way love spoken in poetry can have this kind of influence, can be misread like this. When Dante writes about love in his poetry, he's hoping it's an elevated celestial thing that lifts you up above the common world. But Francesca is using love as a way of dropping herself down and condemning herself to hell. But it gets worse. As Dante hears these words, he pauses and begins to reflect and doesn't speak for a while. It says, there were long minutes while I stood and bowed my head. Finally, Virgil nudges him and asks him to, to wake up and then asks Francesca what her story is how she got into this state. Francesca replies with a few key lines. There is no greater woe than looking back on happiness in days of misery. Your guide can tell you so. But if you are so eager to retrace our love's first route, then I will make it known as one who speaks with tears upon her face. Those lines are actually very significant. Don't forget them. We're coming back to them in a long while with tears upon her face. In reading how Lancelot had been overthrown by love, we chanced to pass the time one day. We sat, suspecting nothing, all alone. Some of the things we read made our eyes stray to one another's, and the color flee from our faces. <gasps> but the point swept us away. We read how that smile desired so ardently was kissed by such a lover, one so fine, and this one, who will never part from me, trembling all over, pressed his lips on mine. The book was a Galahalt, the author as well. That day, we did not read another line. So Francesca talks about how she fell in love with Paolo. They just happened to be innocently reading a book of love poetry about Lancelot together. They got to the part where Lancelot and Guinevere do their thing, and in that moment, when the two lovers in the book are overcome by their passions, it causes Francesca and Paolo to be overcome by their passions. They couldn't help it. Notice how she says the book was a Galahalt, the author as well. Galahalt is a figure within the story of Lancelot and Guinevere who brings them together. One of those go-betweens in a bad relationship. So she's saying, the book of poetry brought us together. It wasn't our fault. It was love's fault. It was poetry's fault. It was the poet's fault. She's blaming all of her problems on poetry and poets. Now, how does that make Dante feel? Dante, upon hearing that poetry is to blame for her fall, takes it to heart. And while she told the tale she had to tell, the other wept. I fainted where I stood out of pity, as if dying, and fell down on the ground the way a dead man would. Okay, I told you when Dante faints, it's important. Here, we see Dante being corrected for his pride in poetry. What happened in the last canto? Well, Dante was in the garden surrounded by the greatest poets of all time, and they say, Dante, you're one of us. And Dante said, yes, I am. I'm the best poet ever. And then the very next thing that happens to him is he walks up and talks to Francesca, and she says, poetry sent me to hell. And Dante takes it to heart. He realizes that although technically it's Francesca's fault, she should have had self-control, it's really her sin, 
poetry had an influence in it. And he realizes that level of responsibility that his own words and his own poetry can have over other people. That other people can take something he wrote and use it as an excuse to destroy themselves. Poetry is a great thing, but it can be misused, just like so many good things out there. And Dante has to realize that being the best poet in the world does not save you. In fact, poetry can sometimes destroy you. Keep an eye out for every time he begins to swell with pride, because we're going to watch this pattern happen again and again and again in the Inferno. He's going to say, yes, I'm awesome, and then the next moment somebody's going to turn around and say, but awesomeness is awfully dangerous. Be careful with it. It's important to see that even though Francesca puts the blame everywhere but herself, Dante will note that what causes you to fall down into the Inferno is your will. Your will is what drives you to do wrong. And although lust is the least willful of the sins, it's still a choice that got her here. We continue in the third circle. So we step out of the lustful into the third circle where we find the gluttonous. And Dante once again is going to step into political commentary. The gluttonous are in this swirling pit of muck and mucky nasty rain is pouring down constantly upon them. And worst of all, as you look down at these sinners, you can't even really tell who they are because they seem to sort of blend in with the muck. The contrapasso here is the idea that gluttony is that attempt to stuff yourself and fill up an emptiness inside. And now their bodies are just amorphous, empty blobs. The idea that you are what you eat really becomes significant here. These people gorge themselves with rich, disgusting foods, and so their bodies are bloated and melting and nasty as they lie in the muck. Not only that, but they're also guarded by Cerberus the watchdog of the underworld. He's got three heads and his three huge mouths seem to symbolize in some way the desire and the hunger that comes with gluttony. Not only that, but in the Aeneid by Virgil, Cerberus can be gotten around by feeding him honeyed cakes. The idea of food tempting the dog away from his job of watching hell. In fact, they get past him in much the same way here. Virgil reaches down and grabs clumps of mud and tosses it into the mouths of the dog. Instead of eating honeyed cakes, though, the dog is eating the same disgusting muck that all these other people are wallowing in and feasting on. The muck really emphasizes how gross gluttony is as a sin. Dante runs into Chaco here, and as he begins to talk with him, the point of this canto really begins to drive home. In fact, Dante can't even recognize Chaco because his body is so bloated and melted down here. He says, but tell me who you are, set in such loss and desolation that, although there might be greater torments, none could be more gross. That's not really true. Later on we're going to find people wallowing in poo. And Chaco begins to talk, saying, Your native city, stuffed so tight with envy that the sack has overflowed, contained me too, back in the days of light. Chaco's the name you citizens bestowed on me. Notice the way he talks about Florence. He says that the city is stuffed tight with envy. The sack has overflowed. The idea that the city of Florence is a body, a political body, but one that is not well off, one that is glutted with envy and bursting. Gluttony becomes a symbol for the way the city of Florence has stuffed itself with envy and rivalries, leading to its ultimate downfall. The image of the gluttonous body stuffing itself that it can't hold anymore and overflows is very disgusting, but it also shows how terrible the sins of Florence are. The idea of a city or a state being called a body is an old one. There was a famous parable in Rome in which the leaders of the town were represented the head of the town. The workers represented the hands, and each part needed each other in order to function. Therefore, a city or a state was like a body. In fact, this same symbol was picked up and used in Christianity to talk about the church and the way the church functions. So the symbol was a very significant one. And here Dante is using that same sort of symbol of Florence as a body, but it's not a healthy body. It's a sick, it's a bloated body. Chaco is going to go on to prophesy about the problems that are coming to Dante in Florence. Blood will follow after strife. The rustic sect will drive the other one out of the city with much loss of life. Before the third full circle of the sun, the vanquished will turn vanquishers. Through dint of one upon the fence, this will be done. He's letting Dante know that the White Gulfs will ultimately fail. He's one of the first prophets that we see in the Inferno, because the souls in the Inferno are able to see the future. That's going to be important later on. Dante is going to go on to ask Chaco if there are any other important souls from Florence that he knows of down here in the Inferno. And Chaco points out where a few of the other ones are. Just as we noticed how Dante used terms of rest and stillness and peace to emphasize how Francesca desired not to be blown around anymore in the last canto, he's also going to use words to emphasize his meaning in this canto. 
Listen to this. Dante says to Chaco, I want to hear whatever you can tell, for I truly wish to discover if they share the honey of heaven or taste the venom of hell. Their separate sins, he said, have dragged them where some of the very blackest spirits stay. Go, keep going down and you will see them there. But when you see the sweet world again, I pray that you bring me to men's memory once more. Nothing else will I answer, nothing will I say. Notice how he uses honey, taste, sweet, all emphasizing this sin of gluttony, the way that the gluttons constantly fed their mouths. And so Dante and Virgil continue on down into the fourth circle. But before they enter the fourth circle, they're going to run into Plutus. Plutus is a mythological figure who symbolizes treasure and wealth. He's also frequently confused with Pluto, the god of the underworld. Here, Plutus is positioned right before the misers and the spendthrifts, the people who wasted their life over money. And so, as god of treasure, this is an appropriate place for him. When he first sees them, he shouts out, Papa Setan, Papa Setan Lepe! Which really means nothing. Sounds like it might have something to do with him claiming allegiance to Satan. There's a decent footnote on that in our books, the Norton Critical Editions. In any case, he's a devouring kind of spirit, but Virgil turns him back and has him devour his own self. Aim your rage inward and eat up your fill. Not without reason do we now advance to the depths. It is willed on high in the lofty skies where Michael avenged the arrogant offense. So once again, Virgil uses the divine pass card to get them past Plutus. And Plutus, who didn't want them to go by, winds up devouring himself. Just as money causes us to devour our own selves. In the next circle are the prodigal and the miserly. Opposites. The miserly are those who hoarded their wealth and hung on to it and never let go of it. The prodigal are those that excessively spent their wealth. Neither is an appropriate response to money. And both have to do with our attempts to control our own fate, our own luck and fortune. The miserly thought they could control their fortune by holding on to wealth. The prodigal thought they could control fortune by blowing it all. And they're running around in a giant circle now, clashing against each other pushing huge weights, and the huge weights seem to represent all that money that they tried to control in their lives. It's like a giant game of bumper cars. <laughs> but not quite so much fun. They roll back and forth and back and forth around the ring, running into each other and then turning around and clashing back the other way. Just as before, the same sin that they did in life is what they're doing now. They tried to control their wealth in life, and now they're hanging on to it for the rest of eternity. Dante notices among the miserly how many are clergymen, which he points out, wow, there's an awful lot of church guys here. This emphasizes the same idea that we saw before, that church politics have caused all kinds of problems in Florence, something that Dante takes offense at, and is going to point out all throughout the Inferno. Before Dante and Virgil go on, though, they comment upon the image of Lady Fortune. Virgil mentions fortune in passing, and Dante questions him on this, and so Virgil goes on to explain. He whose wisdom transcends all, at the very start made the heavens and gave guides to lead them right, so that every part would shine to every part, thus equally distributing the light. For worldly splendors he likewise put in place a general guide and minister who might transfer those empty goods through time and place, beyond all human wit to intervene, from blood to blood, from one to another race. One state grows fat with power, Another grows lean, according to her judgments as she deigns, which, like a snake in the grass, cannot be seen. Your knowledge cannot counter her. She reigns, providing, judging, making calculations, as do the other gods in their domains. No truce may interrupt her permutations. Necessity demands that she not pause. Man's lot is one of constant variations. At this is she whom men put on the cross. Even the ones who ought to hold her dear revile her name and blame her without cause but she is blessed and does not hear. He describes fortune's control established from the beginning of time by God, how she controls the way wealth is distributed throughout the world. Some people have a lot of wealth, some people don't, but it changes in an instant. Fortune is often depicted with a wheel. Yeah, you've probably heard of Wheel of Fortune. But it was a medieval idea that she had a giant wheel that constantly turned. You might be on the wheel in the middle, you might be on the wheel in the top, you might be on the wheel in the bottom, but wherever you were on the wheel, it would turn, and your position would change. You don't stay in the same place forever. It's those people who thought that by clutching to wealth, or by spending their wealth, they could somehow influence fortune, or control her. Those are the ones that are down here. Men sometimes curse fortune, saying, Oh, what terrible luck! I can't believe I lost a thousand dollars! But she doesn't care. She just goes on. 
Because her job is not to make individuals happy. Her job is to keep everything in check. She's just doing what she's been told to do from the beginning of time, and she does it well. Luck be a lady tonight! Virgil points out that time is passing quickly, and their progress down must continue. I didn't point out earlier, though I should have, that this is happening over Easter weekend. Dante was lost in the woods on Good Friday, and found and begins to descend down into the inferno. Ultimately, he's got to get out of here by Easter, because that's really symbolic, right? They descend down further to the fifth circle, which is a river. It's the River Styx. And the River Styx is the home of the wrathful and the slothful, or sullen. Now we're going to see the wrathful a whole lot more soon, because we're going to have to cross the river. And when we cross the river, we'll get to see them plenty. But this is really the only reference to the sullen. Dante can't talk to any of them, because they're sunk at the bottom of the river. They're slothful and sullen, and just didn't want to get up or do anything. So they just kind of sunk down there, and they just didn't even... Early bird catches the worm, Slothful goes to hell. G for the glutton all melted in muck. He stuffed up his body, and now he is stuck. Two lustful sinners who blow in the gale, and lament the false kisses which caused them to fail. Next time on Inferno! Hey, it's Filippo Argenti! I'm gonna beat the snot out of you! Oh boy, I wanna watch! And Dante, our next stop is the city of Dis, which is... Um, um, let me in. Um, excuse me! Excuse me! I, I want to get... I want to get in! Bum 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 It's Inferno, Inferno, but it dum bum bum bum